fatal so-called film noir. She wants to shoot him. This is typical American <coughs> so-called hard boy. He tells her, go on, shoot me, you will do me a favor, you know, this kind of uh, noir mythology. Yes. down, of course. In film noir universe, if a woman wants to kill you, it means she really loves you. <laughs> That's life. <laughs> we are almost there, huh? sorry for this. Now they kiss. <laughs> you will see why this is important. Now watch closely. Casablanca Airport Tower, we return back. And he says, what were you saying? signaling that the same conversation goes on, nothing is disturbed, they are both fully dressed and so on. Okay, stop. That was this is ideology at its absolutely purest. Why? I'm not talking about even what they are talking and so on. As a greedy old dirty man, my first point of interest is what probably interests all of us. Did they do it or not? <laughs> they to say that two and a half seconds where they jump from embracing to this abstract uh, shot of the Casablanca Tower with the light turning around and then back to the room. The question is, is this real time going on or is this uh, just, or does that image stand for the whatever you want? I don't know what are your ideas from 10 minutes to one hour for <laughs> love making and so on. Why? Why is this so important? Because it's done in a very systematic way. If you look at this scene, knowing a little bit about uh, Hollywood, this is the Hays Code Hollywood, you know, strictly codified. Even more codified in a way than in Stalinist Soviet Union. <coughs> Everything was codified. If you don't believe me, check it up. In the Hollywood of 1940s, if you see even a married couple in a bedroom, the bed has to be separated, have to be separated, the couple has to be in pyjamas, like and so on and so on. So, uh, uh, what happens here? The film first gives a whole series of signs, codified signs, thanks very much, let me that we just forgot, that they did it. First, in classical Hollywood, when you embrace, when two lovers embrace, and then you have a slow fade out, this means they did it. This was totally codified. <laughs> Second thing, I think that uh, at the end he drinks or smokes or whatever, this was also strictly codified. Like, you know that proverb that we have in Europe at least, uh, what's the second and the third most pleasant thing in the world? The drink before and the cigarette afterwards, you know, like uh, another sign. Then even the, the, the tower, kind of a primitive phallic symbol. So you get a series of signals they did it. But then at the same time you get a series of signals that they didn't do it. The same conversation seems to go on. There is no disturbed bed or whatever. They are both fully dressed and so on. And I claim the film is not simply inconsistent. The film treats you the spectator, as if you are under some kind of a superego or what, in Lacanian terminology we would have called the, rather more precisely, the ego ideal or the big other control. The film treats you, if we may imagine it, in a kind of prosopopoeia, treats you as a person and addresses you with the following monologue. I know you would like to have your dirty pleasures. But at the same time, you are afraid. You want to appear clear 
in the eyes of power. So I will enable you, I will give you both levels. On the one hand, I will give you all the dirty signals so that you can imagine whatever they were doing. At the same time, I will give you a cover-up story so that if your moral <laughs> authority asks you, how can you enjoy such a dirty story, you can say, what, well, look, nothing happened. They are both dangerous <laughs> and so on. So, and this was, to me, if you ask me, uh, quite a big lesson. I studied a little bit more Hollywood, and then I discovered that how strictly this worked in uh, Hollywood <coughs> case censorship. That every prohibition, or in a codified way, uh, systematically generated that prohibition. For example, in classical Hollywood, if you wanted to signal that a guy is homosexual, it is totally codified. Uh, it's when a guy uses perfume, like if you saw Maltese Falcon, the, desert, the Peter Lorre character, somebody, the detective, Humphrey Bogart, says, oh, what perfume do you use? Means you are gay. <laughs> then, second, if they say about a woman, you come from New Orleans, it means prostitute. <laughs> prostitute, prostitute. No. So it is incredibly how, there is, I don't want to spend too much time, but there is, Joseph Sternberg, the Hollywood director who was the father, uh, uh, the patriarch over uh, Marlene, uh, over Marlene Dietrich, he did a movie with her, and there is he reports in his memoirs about a wonderful debate between him and Joseph Brin, who was uh, uh, the, the case co-functionary. And Joseph Brin asked him, "You have here in scenario a scene where it says." Uh, then follows a romantic interlude. They are in a, they are with some horses in uh, there, in, uh, and then, then on, a, on, a, in a, on a garden there is a romantic interlude. And very brutally, Joseph Brin asked Sternberg, cut the crap, do they fuck or not? <laughs> Sternberg was shocked. He, uh, he said, finally, yeah, they fuck. <laughs> and then Joseph Brin said, okay, now I know, now we will call it codified, we will precisely put it, and so on, and so on. Why is this? so important to see how uh, some of my even leftist friends in cultural studies think that all this dirty background is something subversive. Well, the way they would have read this scene would have been, you see, you have the official ideology and then you have the subversive <coughs> fantasies, sex, whatever you want, and so on. This is my first very simple but extremely important thesis. There is nothing subversive in these obscene fantasies. They are absolutely part of the power system. Power is not only the explicit text <coughs> of power. Power is also, you know, for example, your own Stalin, which is maybe greater than the Russian Stalin, the director from Kerala or what, you sent me his speech. Yeah, okay. ah, you see, even you misrecognized him. You didn't know, <laughs> don't know your Stalin. Uh, he had this movie about uh, Dalits, no? Yeah. Where he, he has this same wonderful scene. He first asks, or the camera, whatever, uh, small pupils in some school uh, uh, who are Dalits, like, how are you treated? And they all say, we are obliged to sit in the back and don't have the right to debate, whatever. And then he asks the teacher. The teacher says, no, these are all lies, absolutely not, and so on and so on. <laughs> so, uh, in other words, uh, Ideology doesn't function as the open text, you know. Uh, this is the perversity of today's ideology, and you are not unique here. I'm not now playing this game of you primitive Indians. If anything, we Western Europeans, Americans are worse. How? If there was some old time where ideology was the oppressive explicit system, and we were able to be subversive by violating it, subverting it, today it's almost the opposite. Officially, we are open, cynical, you can say whatever you want, permissive, but all these obscene prohibitions and so on function as this publicly non-admitted 